السلام عليكم مساء الخير عليكم مشاهدين الكرام أنا سلمان حجي نائب ملحق ثقافي في السفارة الأمريكية في الجزائر أنا فرحان نكون معكم اليوم حيكون عندنا حديث خاص بزاف مع ضيفة خاصة فاليوم حنكون مع روشان عباس وهي المديرة التنفيذية للمنظمة الغير ربحية حملة من أجل الويغر uh, يعني Campaign for Uyghurs في السفارة الأمريكية نأمن أن هذا اليوم اللي هو اليوم العالمي للحق في معرفة الحقيقة فيما يتعلق بالانتهاكات الكبيرة لحقوق الإنسان ومن أجل كرامة الدحايا The International Day for the Right to the Truth Concerning Gross Human Rights Violations and for the dignity of victims موضوع مهم ولازم نناقشه لازم نعرفه انه قصة روشان هي مجرد واحدة من بزاف من القصص المؤلمة اللي تظهر فضائح ليواجهوها الويغر في شينجان وشينجان اقصى غرب الصين احنا تاني نأمن ان الحرية الدينية هي حق اساسي وندافع بحزن على حق الويغر وكيفهم من المسلمين والأقليات في الصين في ممارسة شعارهم هم الدينية ونهار الاثنين هذا الأسبوع أعلنوا كل من الولايات المتحدة والمملكة المتحدة والاتحاد الأوروبي وكندا فرضهم عقوبات على المسؤولين الصينيين لمحاسبة بكين على ممارساتهم التميزية والقمعية واللي تتمثل في الاحتجاز التعسفي والعمل وتعقيم القرسين القصرين اسمح لي ضد الأقليات العرقية في منطقة شينجان وأعلنوا أيضا أنه معاملة الصين للويغر هي إبادة جماعية راحين نهضروا باللغة الإنجليزية في هذا المحادثة مع ملخصات باللغة العربية في الدردشة تقدروا وتكتبوا أسئلتكم لروشان في الدردشة وراحين نجاوبوا على الأسئلة المتعلقة بالموضوع روشان we are very happy to have you here this is a very important topic to discuss um, you know religious freedom is something that the United States really takes pride in we welcome immigrants from all religious backgrounds including Muslims I myself, as a Muslim immigrant, have found uh, a country that accepted me as an immigrant. I have been able to practice my religion freely in the United States. Um, and me and my family and the other Muslim community that I live with, um, you know, have been able to pursue opportunities. So this is one reason, according to also the International Day we are celebrating for the right to the truth and justice, that we are having you here today to learn about your struggle to find truth in your life. Um, welcome to, 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 to the talk. How are you, Rishan? Well, thank you so much, brother. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Um, Rishan, can you please explain to some of the audience, you know, Uyghurs, Xinjiang, they're hearing all these terms that maybe we don't have much background on. What is a Uyghur and what is happening in Xinjiang? Um, Salam alaikum for uh, everybody who's watching. And the, uh, thank you so much again for having me today, giving me the time to talk about the, this in such an appropriate time and on a, such a special day to talk about my people, the Uyghur Muslims um, who are facing the active genocide because of our religion and because of our ethnic identity. The Chinese Communist regime has uh, characterized all normal religious practices as Islamic extremism. And the, on that pretext developed a police state built on DNA collection, ubiquitous cameras, facial recognition software, GPS tracking devices on vehicles, and the QR uh, scanning codes on the Uyghur homes. Um, I will give a little bit of background on who the Uyghurs are and where they are located when I go through my uh, uh, presentation is PowerPoint, but um, I just want to give like a general outlook of what's happening. Basically, Islam is completely banned in both public and the private spaces and being treated as an ideological disease 
by the Chinese Communist regime. And our mosques and the masjids and religious sites have been bulldozed. And parents are banned from naming their children in traditional Muslim names. And the Uyghur Muslims are forced to eat pork and drink alcohol. And they are not allowed to fast during the holy months of Ramadan. And they have burned, uh, the Chinese regime has burned the copy, copies of the uh, Holy Quran while openly declaring to the world that they will rewrite the Holy Quran, astaghfirullah. So, to so Rushan, in, just, to, just to summarize what you're saying, yeah. um, a, a Uyghur is someone who defines themselves ethnically with the Uyghur Turkic population, lives in Xinjiang in the Western region of China. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that Uyghurs do not have the right to practice their faith as Muslims. They can not choose to not eat pork. They cannot name their children Islamic Arabic names. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And, and can you go into more detail about your experience um, um, with this? Um, well, my myself, you know, left my homeland and they came to the United States in 1989. And I have beautiful memories of growing up as a Uyghur Muslim, but my uh, participation in the pro-democracy movements in a Xinjiang University when I was a university student in mid 1980s, uh, which precedes the Tiananmen Square protest. And the, uh, uh, you know, which means that I would face persecution in back home. So with the encouragement of my parents, I left uh, for the United States. I came here in 1980. Nine And in retaliation for my advocacy work here in the U.S., my father back then, um, my late father, he passed away now, but he lost his job when he was only 59 years old. He was forced to retire because of my job, because of my uh, activism here in America. So, you know, as you see, since back then, uh, I have felt the long arm of the communist Chinese regime even in the free country that I lived. And in September 2018, when all this horror happened to Uyghur people, which is the act of genocide right now, and I spoke against the uh, extrajudicial detainment of millions of Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps in a uh, public panel, um, on a pa public panel, after watching my husband's entire family uh, disappearing into the camps, my own sister, a retired medical doctor and my aunt who was uh, uh, retired, uh, who was a school teacher who also retired. They were taken by the Chinese authorities just a few days after I spoke as a uh, retaliation. So to this day, I have not seen my sister's face to prove that she's alive. I have no idea where she is for two and a half years now. I have no idea what's happening to her and her story is not an isolated one. I just want everyone in the audience to think about this, uh, what Rushan is saying. I mean, you have a brother or sister who successful medical doctor and they just disappear for years and you have no idea where they are. It's a very ter terrifying uh, thought, I have an older brother and I could not imagine what I would do, um, Rushan, in this situation. Um, let's let's see what's going on. Um, maybe I'm we can begin to, the presentation? Yes, I'm going to share my screen and the, uh, quickly go through some of the uh, visuals of uh, what's happening. So um, that's my sister in the middle and I have been carrying her picture all over telling the world that she's missing. The one on the left is her daughter. Also, uh, she has a two years old baby now instead of concentrating on her family. She is looking for her mother's information, mother's whereabouts. So uh, the truth is, you know, you see something like this. This is one of the uh, drawn picture. And if the one on the uh, right, those Uyghurs are taken, these, the ones in the black clothes are the Chinese police to the train. This is something that we have witnessed 75 years ago with the, uh, the Holocaust. Um, the Uyghurs are prominently lived in the, uh, you know, um, Central Asia. We call East Turkestan our homeland um, because it's geographical and the uh, 
historical and symbolic name. The Manchus invaded, this was prior to the before Chinese communist regime in uh, our homeland in East Turkestan in 1876 and they gave us the name Xinjiang, which means new territory. And that was in 1884. And our uh, uh, People, the Uyghurs uh, staged numerous uprisings against the, uh, the Chinese regime and the, uh, twice in the 33 and 44 established the free uh, country. But uh, since 1949 it's being occupied. As you see in the map, it's located right in the heart and the, uh, the Chinese census has 12 million Uyghurs but the Uyghur as, uh, consensus shows over 20 million. It's about four times of California size-wise one sixth of entire China. And the, our homeland is very rich on the uh, natural gas, oil, and the uh, coal reserves, and also 84% of China's cotton output comes from our homeland. And that is the main reason why the Uyghurs are facing genocide right now. And this is the, uh, this is not the, the camps I'm talking about, this is the regular people like you and me, the normal people's lives, they are subject to check and the going through uh, like uh, uh, harassment and humiliation and every step. And the one on the left corner, it looks like a war zone, but this is a, uh, uh, one of the just peaceful city in, uh, in our homeland. And because of uh, you know, racism uh, and the, the ultra uh, Han uh, Chinese uh, communist regime is nationalism and the cutting edge technology uh, are basically controlling the entire Uyghur population, all Uyghurs are being treated as the criminals. And that those are some of the uh, things that uh, can get people into the concentration camps. And there are some news reports, they said 48 ways to get the uh, Uyghur people, Uyghur Muslim to concentration camps, as little as just in praying or wearing a headscarf or hijab or um, traveling to Muslim majority countries, uh, or fasting during Ramadan. It's just that anything that the, all the other people in the, in the world practice, the normal Islam are being treated as uh, illegal uh, Islamic activities. So Rushan, um, just, I, I find this fascinating. I mean, really difficult, if you don't mind going back to the previous slide. Um, this is from uh, uh, an outlet that is very well respected. Um, if you don't mind, if you go back to the last screen on the amount, the, the items that would get you in jail. Owning a compass, owning a compass can get you locked up, uh, get, having a beard, yeah. um, watching a video filmed abroad and having WhatsApp. So that's, that's ridiculous. That's, do you know maybe someone who has done, all, done any of this and gotten locked up? Yes. Many, many people. Um, I know one of my classmates and the, uh, who actually threw himself from the uh, eighth floor, killed himself because he was so afraid of uh, being taken to the concentration camps when they came to pick him up in Urumqi uh, because of the horror that people are facing. And the, his guilt was because uh, on, on Juma, uh, he went to Juma prayer one time. And anything, you know, even just the, uh, using a WhatsApp on your phone or talking to anybody in any of the Islamic, uh, like Muslim majority countries, if you have a classmate or relative living in Turkey or in Saudi Arabia or uh, in Dubai, if you talk to him or her, then that will cause you going to the concentration camps. If you tell somebody, hey, don't drink alcohol because uh, it's against our religion. That could cause you to uh, take into the concentration camps. If uh, you have a nikah, the Islamic uh, uh, marriage ceremony, that could cause you to get to the concentration camps. So basically, China outlawed all normal Islamic practice. And the, what, when they are talking about, they are fighting um, radicalization and the Islamic extremism. That's all lies. No such a thing. All these people are innocent, just regular people like any one of us. Their only crime is them being Muslim. Thank you, Rushan. Um, yeah, let's. That's incredible. 
and the uh, basically China's Communist Party's war on Islam um, is, you know, basically uh, not just the treating the people and also uh, eradicating any kind of Islamic uh, culture or ethnic uh, ethnic identity that we have. Um, this one, the one on the top, that's a mosque, all the old masjid in Kashgar. Anybody who reads Chinese, they can read that. It became bar. Juba means in Chinese is bar, nightclub. The one on the left top that's inside of the, the masjid converted to a bar. And the, those two pictures on the bottom, they are burning Quran and the prayer rugs in the front of the people. This is like showing, like, uh, you know, basically humiliating, dehumanizing the Uyghur people and stigmatizing our religion and saying that if you engage with reading copies of Holy Quran or um, if you pray, then you know you are uh, your face uh, persecution. And that's a picture of uh, the inside of the concentration camps. And the, uh, the one on the right top shows there's a I have a picture of, five, of four, actually there's one more. Five people were identified from this picture from the Uyghurs in diaspora. And all these people are showing in this picture. Um, one of them is a, a, a professor. He's a, a teacher at the university. The another one um, was, uh, he had uh, like his own like little business shop. And the, the another one was an imam in the mosque. Uh, in the masjid. And the uh, the one on the bottom, this guy was a, a, a taxi driver and he drove somebody. He's taken to the concentration camp because he drove somebody uh, to, uh, to a mosque to pray on Friday or some holiday, like few years back. And he was taken a few years later for him driving, because he was a taxi driver, driving somebody to, to the MSG. So those are the kind of crimes that, uh, well, actually none of these people, more than 3 million Uyghurs in the concentration camps, none of them are charged with anything, any kind of crimes. They were there just uh, taken and the, the Chinese regime claims that they are radicalized Muslims and they are, uh, they are trying to uh, re-educate them and to teach them job skills so they can get the jobs. Um, some of the uh, pictures of the uh, concentration camps and uh, there's a forced labor going on as uh, there's a, you know, against the factories that the Uyghurs are being used as slaves. Those are some of the, uh, the former detainees uh, in abroad. They were lucky to be in a, in outside of China, because uh, either they are citizens of other countries or they married to uh, the citizens of uh, other countries like uh, uh, Kazakhstan or uh, Egypt. And they, according to those witnesses, the victims in those camps, those more than 3 million Uyghur Muslims, uh, they are not only subject to intense indoctrinations, but they are also forced to forsake their ethnic identity and their religion forsake Islam, denounce Islam, and the uh, subject to women, not just the only women, even men are subject to systematic mass rape, and that they are uh, subject to food and the sleep deprivations. And this is uh, Tursnay Ziaudun, one of the uh, uh, former detainee, she's, um, she was in Kazakhstan and now she's living in the United States. And there's a horrible, horrible testimonies she gave recently reported in BBC and the uh, CNN. When I, when I read that, I couldn't sleep for days because my sister is there. She talks about horrible sexual abuses that she was subject to, gang rape, sexual torture. She's 42 years old. And they, uh, that's what's happening to your Muslim Uyghur sisters in the camps. Thank you so much, Roshan, for bringing this up because, you know, March in the United States is National Women's History Month. 
And we are paying special attention this month to showcase on our social media, the ways in which women are contributing to our country's history and what the United States has done in, in this uh, field. And to show that women, specifically women in uh, Xinjiang, Uyghur women face this kind of burden, it's, it's inhumane and, and it really shows a tragedy uh, on, on that part uh, of, of how women are treated. So thank you for elaborating on this. And I know it's probably not an easy story to tell. Thank you. And the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Uyghurs were subject to of mandatory DNA collections and we had no idea what was that for. Then later, there is this picture that uh, reported in a Japanese uh, TV uh, station. Um, there is a special line at the airport in Kashgar. Kashgar is uh, mostly the Uyghur Muslims are populated area. And the, at the airport, they have a special dedicated line for passengers who are transporting human organs. Imagine that. And also at the same time, we have seen some of the uh, advertisings for halal organs being advertised from some of the uh, Chinese um, hospitals in China proper. So basically the Uyghurs are prepped in those concentration camps for them to, um, you know, for the Chinese uh, communist regime to take their organs. And this is a, a, a picture before and after picture. And the, the one on the left was just a few years back, five, six years ago. And this is the area that the Uyghur Muslims come in the morning. Uh, once sunrise, they come with their uh, goods and they, you know, they come and they sell and they trade and they uh, chat and they visit. And then uh, after sunset, they go home. So during the sunlight, if you go there, this is the picture that how always, you know, people are a uh, very lively area was always uh, crowded. And the one on the right is how it is now. What happened to the people? I wanted to say, you know, it's uh, seeing these pictures makes you think that there, you, you cannot doubt when something is seen and, and pictures prove that. Uh, تقدر تشوف في السويرة باللي كان اختلافات في الماضي والآن ولازم تخمم كيفاش هيكون المستقبل إذا كان هادو الناس كامل قاعدين سجن وسجن في السجن سي سي فريمون تريست ويغيدوني والله تانكس روشان and the most tragic part is the uh, the Uyghur Muslim women, those are your Muslim brother, you know, Muslim sisters. Those are your women in, in, our, in our culture, in our religion. How delicate a woman is supposed to be protected. But the Uyghur women are facing systematic mass rape, basically government sponsored mass rape in the name of the sham marriages because the Uyghur women are forced to marry Han Chinese if they refuse, they will be taken to the concentration camps for um, refusing to marry non-Muslim Han Chinese. So she will be viewed as radicalized Islamic extremist. Can you imagine that? If you cannot choose who you want to marry and who you don't want to, and what is that? You know, that is being raped in the name of marriage. Look at these pictures of those Uyghur women. Look like, look, look at them. This is their wedding. It's supposed to be the happiest day in their lives, but they look like it's their funeral. You don't see a smile on their face. This picture on the, the bottom left, the girl in the red dress, um, this, this is a video. Actually, um, I took this uh, from this video clip. Uh, the, the person who's taking the picture asks the guy, how long have you guys known each other? He giggles and he says, a couple of months in a couple of months before they got married. And then she starts crying. So that tells you, her face tells you what the, the Uyghur Muslim girls are facing, basically. Um, not only that, they are being humiliated on the streets. Uh, what the Chinese government calls 
the illegal Islamic clothing are not just the wearing hijab or you know covering their hairs, but just the wearing a little bit long shirts. They are being humiliated on the streets, getting their shirts cut, so their behind will be open. What is this? You know, have you seen something like this anywhere in the world? But the Uyghur uh, Muslim sisters are subject to that, and also the uh, state uh, Chinese state. On media reported 1.1 million Han Chinese cadres assigned to Uyghur homes to live inside of their houses and they uh, supervise, supervise their daily lives and monitor their daily activities. Most of the husbands are taken to either to the concentration camps or to the prisons or to the forced labor facilities in the China proper the most of the Uyghur women are subject to sexual abuse because these Han Chinese men are living inside of their houses. And this video I'm going to share shows that uh, there's at least, there's four men here because three on the bed with this Uyghur Muslim woman and she has a baby in her arm and there's one taking the video. So there is at least four men in this house. I just wanted to, to make it clear to our viewers, Rushan, before you start the video. Uh, Rushan hakat ala ta'amul ma nisa al Uyghuriya. Wahina ana dahashd ki smatum kaman saha kalit bili al nisa al Uyghuriya. Lazim yit zawajna ma al rijal al sini gher muslim adam. تسامح من النساء دونك النساء ما عندهمش الاختيار لازم يتزوجوا مع هادو الرجال اللي غير مسلمين ضد ضد ارادتهم ضد اراده الانس النساء ودوكا راح تقول باللي هما الرجال الصيني غير مسلم يراقبون النساء في بيوتهم ويشوفوا كيفاش هما يعيشون كيفاش إذا راهو مسلمات إذا يتص إذا يتصلوا وش راه يدير إذا صايمين دونك هذا سي سي فيغ سي فريمون غاف دوكا نشوفوا فيديو كيفاش النساء المسلمة الويغورية سون فورسي باش ترقد مع الرجال الصيني غير مسلم ضد إراداتهم طبعا جو أهيد روشان ليتس واتش ذا فيديو So this is the Uyghur woman that is clearly not looking happy. And she's sharing a, a room with men that doesn't look like she's close to them, right, Rushan? No, she doesn't know them. Well, it's they're living in her house forcefully and they are Han Chinese men looking at their the video. So that's what's happening to Uyghur women and the uh, Uyghur children. Basically, the Uyghur uh, Muslim children are uh, taken to the, from their homes. Recently, the report showed more than 880,000 Uyghur children are taken to state-run orphanages. And look at it, the one uh, on the, the left corner here is one of the orphanages. Looks like a prison with double bar barbed wires and the uh, armed policemen at the front and the gates are locked. And the uh, those Uyghur kids are wearing clothes that even Han Chinese don't wear it in the today's world, you know? Those are like very traditional Han Chinese clothing. So basically uh, giving the Uyghur Muslim children are uh, giving them a new identity as a uh, Chinese communist, you know, atheist identity. So, and what's happening to the Uyghurs today? Uyghurs are not just only facing uh, those kind of uh, brutal, uh, brutality and the facing active genocide, but the Chinese regime is taking every uh, single benefit out of their uh, sweat, tears, and the blood. And there is a report from uh, American Strategic Policy Institute that Uyghurs for sale. Basically, Uyghurs are being sold uh, for the uh, the world brand names to 
to use as a slaves. So basically the Chinese communist regime brought back the uh, modern day slavery as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roshan, for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to say something to the viewers that just joined us. اليوم رانا نحكي مع روشان عباس وهي مديرة تنفيذية لمنظمة الغير ربحية حملة من أجل الويجر اللي هو كامبين فور ويجرز نحكي على حكايتها باش نعرفوا وش صرت لأختها اللي كانت وقيلة سجنت في السجن هي ما تعرفش أصلا وين راهي أختها كانت طبيبة ومن بعد سيبو راحت وما لبلهاش وين راحت اليوم نحكيو عشان بمناسبة اليوم العلمي للحق في المعرفة الحقيقة فيما يتعلق بالانتهاكات الكبيرة لحقوق الإنسان ومن أجل كرامة الضحايا اسألوا أسئلتكم إذا تحبوا في الدردشة ورايحين نجاوبوا على أسئلتكم um, so now, Rushan, I will just ask you, um, can you tell us, you know, going to the United States, you are a passionate activist. What does your activism look like? And what, what, what do you see your activism like in the future? What's going on uh, with Campaign for Uyghurs in the U.S.? Um, I am uh, actually I'm one of the uh, co-founders of for the first Uyghur organization ever in the United States. Uh, we co-founded uh, this organization in 1993. Uh, the name was the Uyghur Overseas Students and Scholars Association, and I served as the first uh, vice president. Uh, initially, you know, uh, back then, uh, no one understood who the Uyghur Muslims uh, were or the issues that uh, our people were facing. And the uh, largest obstacle uh, always was, and it continues to be even now, uh, is the lack of awareness on uh, who the Uyghur Muslims are or the, how the uh, Chinese regime functions and the treats the Uyghur Muslims. So uh, we have always been uh, focused on uh, taking advantage of any platform that we can, like social media or uh, communicating with universities or uh, you know, working with grassroots organizations. Um, to spread awareness on the uh, China's genocidal uh, actions. And then now with uh, the Campaign for Uyghurs, that's what we are trying to do. Campaign for Uyghurs was founded in the uh, uh, end of 19, uh, um, end of uh, 2017 when the situation deteriorated rapidly. So the Chinese regime has always uh, sought to control the narrative and the force silenced by uh, threatening innocent people so now, uh, you know, at the point I am dealing with the abduction of my own sister, as I mentioned, uh, in response to speaking the truth. And I am not alone. You know, many Uyghurs are facing the similar uh, situation in the United States and the, the, all over the, uh, uh, you know, all over the world. So over the decades, the China has uh, not reformed. Rather, basically, you know, the uh, Chinese Communist Party has become um, emboldened to carry out such actions which are more in line with an uh, international criminal organization rather than a uh, legitimate government. Thank you, Rushan. Um, on that, uh, you know, you came to the United States about 30 years ago. Uh, we have a commentator uh, watching you right now, and, and he's asking, his name is Saeed Abdullah. How do you know what's going on in Xinjiang uh, with the Uyghurs if you've been outside for so long and, and now you're an American, you know, what, how do you know what's going on there? Well, there are more than a million Uyghurs probably in diaspora, a lot, uh, like uh, 50, 60,000 Uyghurs living in Turkey and a lot more in Central Asia. Every one of them, Everyone Uyghur you speak to, they have family members who are taken to the concentration camps. My husband, my husband's entire family, 24 people, 14 of his nieces and nephews, my in-laws, my three sister-in-laws and their husbands, they're all gone. This is 21st century. He doesn't even know if, if his parents are still alive. So this is the situation that uh, we are facing, the Uyghurs in diaspora. And also, I know the situation because the Uyghurs are 
basically jeopardizing their freedom and their lives to send us messages. They are contacting us and whatever they can using double VPNs or when they go to China proper. Uh, you know, there, there's one person actually uh, started to use YouTube last year, Uyghur man and the giving information, then he disappeared just a few days after. We have no idea what happened to him now. So people are uh, basically giving out their freedom and the lives to get us information. And also there are leaked Chinese government's leaked documents, three sets of leaked documents, states everything I'm saying. This is not just what I'm saying or what the human rights organizations are saying, or if the uh, experts are, uh, you know, scholars are saying, those are the Chinese government's, their own secret documents leaked out. And if you read that, that tells you everything what the Chinese government is doing is an active genocide. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roshan, for that. Um, you know, the next question I had for you. All right, let's, let's take a look at it from the Chinese point of view. And, and I want to see uh, what you know, the Chinese, they claim that they're trying to get a handle on extremism uh, among the Uyghur population, which is majority Muslim, um, and that they're building um, centers, camps, to alleviate poverty and teach skills. What is the reality of this on the ground? Um, are there actual camps to help the Uyghurs get, you know, alleviate their, their situation, um, learn new skills and get new jobs? What's the reality? My personal story, my sister is a retired medical doctor. She retired because of the health reasons, but she was medical doctor and spoke fluent Chinese. She didn't need any kind of uh, job training and she's not the radicalized Muslim. And she never traveled to any of the Muslim majority countries. And she never really uh, gone to uh, Masjid to pray because in our culture, the women, they don't go to masjid, only men go. That's why there's so many men are taken. Um, so just looking at my sister and my husband's family too, they are all farmers and they, you know, have a job. I mean, uh, they have lives, normal lives. They are not poor, they are not rich, but they are living normal lives. They don't need a job skill, a job uh, skills. Uh, 73 and 75 years old, my in-laws, what kind of job training do they need? And they are not radicalized Muslims. So the Chinese authorities have changed their narrative regarding the camps multiple times without much pause from the international community over their outright lies, basically. Initially, they denied even the existence of the camps. When the satellite footage is leaked out, then they said they were re-education centers or vocational training schools. And then actually one AP reporter, she gone through, she's a Han Chinese, so uh, she reads Chinese. So she went through uh, hundreds of Chinese government's documents and she found one purchase order that uh, for only one so-called re-education centers. But this purchase order showed mass purchases of pepper sprays and handcuffs and the uh, all kinds of things that you use in prison, not in the educational vocational training centers. So the Chinese government claims that those centers are alleviate the poverty and teach job skills, but the detainees includes thousands of university students, professors, writers, poets, doctors, elites, philanthropists, and successful business owners. Um, and in all fields, you know, they're professionals in all fields, the youth and the elderly, none of whom need the job training. And also the Chinese government is bringing so many Han Chinese peer settlers and giving them preferential job treatments, giving them all kinds of good jobs and the uh, uh, basically uh, uh, restructure the population demographics in our homeland. So why they come and they get all kinds of jobs and the Uyghurs has to take into China proper to work in the factories against their will, against, you know, without their freedom. And the uh, basically that's modern day slavery. So 
basically the Chinese government is using the uh, trade threats and the power of the Belt and Road Initiative and that threat diplomacy and the manipulation within the United Nations as the second largest donor and those kind of lies and the spreading disinformation and the false narratives. And that they are uh, trying to, uh, basically they're uh, trying to become the power able to strong arm the world and keeping everybody uh, in, a, in, a, you know, like a, in a false Thank narratives. You. Yeah. Thank you. Before I go to my last question and then we'll go to the questions from the audience, I just wanted to say, um, you know, you and I are both Muslim Americans. Uh, we've grown up in Muslim majority or rather Muslim majority communities. Um, and we've come to the United States as Muslims um, and we've kept that identity that we have. Um, this is just to refer to the questions that we have in the chat uh, about the treatment of Muslims and African-Americans in the United States, immigrants, whatever it may be. Many of these are also coming from our Chinese audience members. We welcome you and we thank you for being with us today and asking these kinds of uh, important questions. I just wanted to respond that, I wanted to say that the United States is a democracy. We talk about these things. The best way for us to talk about these tough issues is to actually talk about them uh, and discuss these problems openly. Last summer, for example, we had the anti-racism protests, uh, Black Lives Matter, um, all these, uh, protests that were brought on by the killing of George Floyd. This is a topic that we at the U.S. Embassy also care about and we discuss on our social media. We have uh, dozens of these conversations live um, with activists or people who represent these passionate issues uh, on our YouTube channel and, and we welcome you to watch those as well. It's a topic that we as a society discuss openly about um, immigration, racism, uh, you know, religious freedom in the United States. We wanted to debate the we want to debate the roots of this problem and possible solutions, and that's why we have you here today, Rushan. Uh, I don't, I mean, compare this to China, Rushan. I don't think anyone is under the impression that the Chinese Communist Party allows any kind of freedom of expression in China. Um, you said yourself that anyone who has even WhatsApp. Um, could be subject to, to imprisonment. Um, just having a communication tool um, or even having any texts in Arabic could be subject to imprisonment. So people who talk about the oppression of Muslims in Xinjiang, they themselves disappear and their families can be put in danger. Uh, myself, as a Muslim American, I thank God that I have the opportunity as an American to practice my religion I can grow a beard if I want to. I can fast for Ramadan and not have any issues. Um, you know, I've, I've had iftars with Americans who are not Muslims and they are shocked that we have such a rich um, religion and, and culture, Rushan. So I just wanted to put that into perspective um, and share a comment that I uh, really resonated with uh, from Ibti. She, uh, he or she says, Sadiqi, zar Turkistan al-Shirkiya wa sawar khafiya الويغور يخافون حتى من أظهار أنهم سائمون في رمضان يعيشون إرهاب حقيقي and that means Rushan uh, this person was just saying that they have a friend who visited uh, Xinjiang and saw that uh, those who tried to fast for Ramadan have to do it uh, you know in fear uh, and in terror in real terror uh, Rushan before uh, so my last question for you is what is the solution have you found any kind of hint as to what could have happened to your sister? And how can the global community play a role to, to help improve religious freedom for Uyghurs in China and around the world? Um, there are several, several comments uh, that we have asking how people in Algeria can help uh, your uh, campaign for Uyghurs Association. Thank you so much. And I know we are running out of time, but I would like to take five, six minutes to really you know, say something from deep from my heart as a sister of somebody um, who is suffering in a dark dungeon there because of this uh, freedom, because of this uh, uh, you know, courage that I had to speak against China's uh, genocide against the Uyghur Muslims, challenging the human dignity and basic survival rights that Allah give us with our birth. So um, basically our silence will undermine, you know, uh, what we value in our faith, in Islam, in our Holy Quran. Uh, 
It's a very dire situation, but I believe there is still hope as long as if we have a breath to speak. The world has already largely failed the Uyghur Muslims, but perhaps it's not too late. Today, so I ask for your help and support so that together we can act with the compassion, courage, and the conviction that are necessary to win over the evident evil, the enemy of Islam, the CCP. So please share what you have heard today. Share this information with all of your family, friends, and your connections. And please ask your leaders not to import products that tainted by your Uyghur Muslim brother and sisters slave labor. Please ask to boycott the uh, Olympic Games, which is a genocidal game, and raise the issue with uh, the OIC, Organization for Islamic Corporation. And uh, please include Uyghurs in your prayers. In the end, of course, it's only Allah who decides our face, but it's still our responsibility to act and to put the freedom we have been blessed with good, you know, to use uh, you know, to good use. Talk to your imam uh, about it at your masjid and ask them to at least pray for the Uyghur Muslims. The only way we build a critical mass of support sufficient enough to end this genocide is by spreading the word as widely as we can. Please follow our organizations and engage with us uh, or even, you know, start your own little uh, you know chapter groups or events like this to start to raise civic society awareness this is the key and the uh, i want to finish uh, by uh, reminding the islamic hadith on brotherhood says the parable of the believers in their affection mercy and the compassion for each other is that of a body when any limb aches the whole body reacts with sleeplessness and the fever but currently, my people, the Uyghur Muslims, are being amputated from that body. We need to see that reaction from our Muslim Ummah. You hear the cries of agony from the millions of Uyghur Muslims and from the Uyghur children who scream out for their parents and the sobs of your Uyghur Muslim sisters who were raped, sterilized, and forced to abort their babies. Still, the most pain for us is the silence from the world community, in particularly from our Muslim brothers and sisters. The Muslim states remain indifferent to this genocide because of China's Belt and Road Initiative, accompanied by short-term economic benefits. But in the end, China will be the only one who truly benefits from that. It will do unto all Islamic countries what it is doing in East Turkestan to Uyghur Muslims. So enforce atheist communist ideology and the kill of Islam. So I plead the Ummah to take up the cause of saving Uyghur lives and the, uh, concurrently you know, protecting Islam from China's war on religion as is our obligations as Muslims. And we need to engage with these issues as not just defending Uyghur Muslims, but defending Islam. And the, uh, you know, China is basically erasing Islam from the hearts of more than 20 million Uyghurs. So the Uyghur cause should be treated as a part of cause of Islam, al qadiyat al-Islam. So I plead here, please help raise awareness and shed lights on this genocide. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. That was very powerful, um, really. A really passionate words that you have. Clearly this issue matters to you. It matters to you because you've lost uh, your, your, your friends and family to this issue. Um, and it's really something that um, if we accepted people for what they believed in, in their religion and allowed them to practice that, uh, we come out as a stronger society, as a more tolerant and welcoming society. Um, don't, احنا مع روشان عباس وهي مديرة تنفيذية لحملة كامبين فور ويجرز كاين ناس بزاف سقساو كيفاش نقدروا نعاونوهم وحكات روشان عباس باللي تقدروا تخمموا في هذه يعني ازدياد الواعي على هذه القضية مهمة بزاف احكيوا مع بعض احكيوا مع الناس مع امام المسجد 
خمموا فيها في شهر رمضان المبارك وأحكيوا كيفاش تقدروا تعاونوا الأمة المسلمة موجودة في الصين في المريكان في كل البلدان العالم إحنا أمة واحدة هذه هي كلمات روشان عباس um, We are going to go to the some questions now روشان uh, We have a question from Ismail Labba He's asking Uh, does your activism present a burden on your personal life? I Do I have personal life now? I had a profession, I had a job, I have families, but since the abduction of my sister, I quit my full-time job, I became a full-time activist. Ever since my sister was abducted, I have not taken a day off. I work seven days a week, no matter you know what kind of holiday or what it is because i need to be the voice for those voiceless people and the uh, tell the world communities that uh, if the world don't wake up our faith will be the future of the entire world with the uh, chinese communist ideologies spreading and controlling the world so i have obligation to this, you know, it's like, it's all of our responsibility as uh, what kind of world we want to live for our children and for our grandchildren. So I have to continue doing what I'm doing. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Roshan. I wanted to say to Roshan Abbas, I wanted to say to you today, after this discussion, let's try a little bit. نفسكم روحكم في مكان روشان وخمموا كيفاش يكون حياتكم إذا كان عندكم خاوتك أخ ولا أخت في بلد آخر ما ما عندكمش أي أخبار عنهم راهم كانوا موجودين معك حياتك كنتوا في نفس البيت نفس الدار ومن بعد هي جاء هذا الايديولوجي تاع الحزب الشيوعي الصيني راحوا يعني ما كانش هم خمموا اذا كنتوا في هذه المنطقه ما تقدروش يكون عندكم لحيه ما تقدروش تصوموا ما تقدروش تحتفلوا باي من حفلات في شهر رمضان المبارك ما تقدروش ميم با عندكم اي بوصله باش تروحوا تصلوا هذا شيء مدهش وراهب ما ما نقدرش روشان I was just telling people um, because it's such an unimaginable thing for us as Muslims in Algeria or in the United States we are allowed to do all the things that maybe Muslims in Xinjiang cannot and um, I just wanted to tell the audience to put themselves in your place And that is one way to connect with Campaign for Uyghurs. Um, and, and we really thank you uh, for, for being here. Um, I wanted to tell the audience, if you are interested in learning more about Campaign for Uyghurs, you can go to their website, campaignforuyghurs.org. Uh, if you want to know more about this event and about Roshan Abbas and her work, تقدروا تروحوا على موقع على الانترنت campaignforweigers.org سوف نشارك هذا العنوان على الدردشة وإذا حابين تتصلوا معنا معهم عندهم تاني صفحة على فيسبوك روشان you have a Facebook right campaign for Uyghurs طبعا وإذا حابين تشاركوا هذا الكلمة سيلفو بلاي بارتاجيو تعيشوا هذا الفيديو مع اصحابك مع اصحابكم هذا الفيديو سوف يبقى على صفحتنا على اليوتيوب وان شاء الله نحب مناقشه معكم في وقت اخر اكتبوا اسئلتكم وروشان عباس طبعا موجوده في كامبين فور ويجرز So thank you so much, Roshan Abbas. It's been a pleasure to host you. Um, I think it's been a very interesting uh, topic um, that is not very, very much talked about. We really enjoyed having you. 
Um, and to those of you interested in this topic, we have uh, another expert that we will be talking to next week on Wednesday at 4 p.m. on our YouTube channel about the Belt and Road Initiative. Rushan Abbas mentioned this, uh, uh, that the Belt and Road Initiative is a factor in the way Uyghurs are being treated. Um, and this talk will be in French and English with Arabic subtitles. Donc, إذا حابين تعرفوا أكثر على سياسة الصين وكيفاش هذا التداخل مع الويجر واقتصاد الصين الحوار الأسبوع القادم هيكون بزاف مهم سوف نتكلم عن the Belt and Road Initiative اللي هي سياسة الصين في الاقتصاد وكيفاش نتعاملوا كشخص عادي يعني في الجزائر في المريكان في كل بلد في في العالم وهذا المحاضرة حيكون على يوم الأربعاء أربعة مساء في صفحتنا على اليوتيوب شكرا لكم مشاهدين الكرام وإن شاء الله نتلاقاو الوقت القادم Thank you Rushan so much for being here with us today um, We really commend your activism and, and we hope um, that these tough questions that you have, they get answered, inshallah. And uh, thank you for being here.